the church is in trouble. Not this church. <laughs> I should qualify that. The church in general, though, is really struggling right now. I was very surprised to read a couple of separate surveys that have been done this uh, past month in the United States. One of them showed that church attendance, even among professing Christians, is way, way down. In fact, I think it was like 37% of people who said they were born again had said they'd not been to church in six months. It's amazing, and it's getting worse. And, and not only that, but there is a growing number of professing Christians who say that while they acknowledge faith in Jesus Christ, feel a need in their lives to bring other types of philosophies and other types of religions to sort of round them out, I guess. I would say drag them down. But a lot of people are in the what I would call the Burger King uh, style of religion, the have it your way. They sort of have a spiritual potluck and they go around the table of world religions and philosophies and they pick a little bit of what they like with uh, Jesus Christ and then they might go down the table a little bit and, and there's a great potato salad there that Buddha put together and so they, they take out a little bit of that and then maybe further down uh, on the table they, they have a little bit of uh, nature worship that really kind of resonates with them, seems very PC anyway, so they pull a little of that out and they kind of put it on their plate and then that becomes their philosophy of life. It becomes their spiritual life. Now, the Bible has a word for that other than sin uh, because putting anything before Jesus Christ is idolatry which is against the character of God. But the, the word for it is syncretism. And it basically means that you are trying to sync up all kinds of different religions and philosophies together. And it doesn't work in the long run. It, it's not what they would call efficacious. It has no lasting effect on a life except to pull you away from Jesus Christ. Now, I want to focus on um, something in particular that has to do with what's causing these changes in the lives of Christians because I think it bears on our study here in 2 Corinthians. And that is this particular time we have let the world's values and methods infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ. And thus, it's really served to weaken the appeal to what I would call pre-Christians that to come to Jesus means there's really a transformed life because as the world's value system and methods is in the church more and more. When, the, when a pre-Christian looks at the church, they just say, well, it doesn't look any different from anything else out there. <coughs> so it just has relative value. Some is better, some is not. And so it leads to this sort of syncretism. And then secondly, it also leads to weakened bonds of continued fellowship of believers that are already in the church. Because again, if the church becomes indistinguishable from the world around us, then what the world offers has just as much value as what the church offers, and so I, I can take it or leave it. Maybe I won't go. Maybe I will. I believe this is what was happening in Corinth almost 2,000 years ago, so as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun, but it's interesting that it's also happening here today. Now, Corinth, as you probably know from having been here for a lot of our studies in First and Second Corinthians, Corinth was a very cool city. It was sort of the hip happening place of, uh, of Achaia and, and uh, much of the world at that time. They had the games that were there and they had all these great temples and they really felt like they were very kind of cool and with it people. And into that atmosphere, they struggled enough as it was, but into that kind of atmosphere came these leaders who really fit the bill of somebody that was very cool, hip happening kind of, I think this person is really impressive they acted and sounded like people that could be trusted, but in fact, their doctrine was poison, and it didn't mirror the character of Jesus Christ, but it mirrored the character of this age that surrounded them. And that is external impressiveness, a focus on power and position, an emphasis on monetary gain, and a lethargy when it came to the transformation of character that each disciple should experience 
in Jesus Christ. And that was because these people didn't represent Jesus at all. If they'd had business cards and they were really true, I suppose on one side it might have said, cool, hip, happening leader, I represent Jesus Christ, but then when you turned it over it said, ha ha, I fooled you, I really represent Satan. Because that's really what Paul says that they did. And Satan's chief aim in the church is to emasculate the believer, to make us unusable to the King of Kings to help spread the gospel. And he will do that, this, this method, this scheme of the enemy is to basically make us take upon ourselves the value system of this age and kind of shun the values of the Lord that he's trying to work into our lives. So what better way to do that than make the church look just like the world around it? And sadly to this day, or in this day, we see this a lot happening right around us. Slick marketing, which is, has no substance behind it. Promotion of relative truth, which basically means I have a, an idea of what I think the truth is and you have an idea of what you think the truth is and when we get together, the truth changes because we have different ideas about what it is. So in every room, the truth is different. That's rampant in our society today. It also has infiltrated the church. The problem of attracting attenders rather than building disciples and abandoning anything that makes people feel uncomfortable. Now, those of you who know me know I, I'm not into just then a, a bringing a bunch of rules and regulations that'll make you feel bad and make you feel guilty. That's not the, the point at all. That's just legalism. But there has to be a transformation of character. You know, Jesus coming into a life needs to make a difference. And that difference is we act more like human beings ought to act. You know, there was, there's a way that, that God is and, and it's how things happen in the universe. Satan took that and warped it and twisted it, make us think that that's the way things are supposed to go, but it's simply not true. And one of these day, days, God's going to come along and say, you know, things are going to now go the way they're supposed to go. And so Jesus comes into a life and he says, I'm going to change this person from the inside out. It's, it's called a metamorphosis. So there has to be some change that's going on. And if it's not, if everything that we are and everything that we do could, is indistinguishable from the age around us, we have to ask a question of what's missing here. So let's see how Paul addresses this in the life of the Corinthian church. Starting in chapter 12, verse 11, and you know, as the, the prior section here, he went into quite a defense of himself against these super apostles. And he talked about all this boasting and bragging he was going to do. And then when he actually got into it, what he was boasting and bragging about were the weaknesses in his life. And if you missed that message, I'd highly encourage you to get it off the website or uh, get the, uh, the CD because it really, uh, <clears throat> I think, is, is super important for the Christian to realize that the, the junk and the stuff and the difficulties we go through in this life, that's normative. And it's okay because God is still at work no matter how bad things look in your life, you know? So he, he says in verse 11, I've become a fool. You've forced it on me. I ought to have been recommended by you since I am in no way inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. And that was, of course, what was taking place is as these super apostles, in quotes, came in, they cast doubt upon the relationship of the Apostle Paul with the church at Corinth. Paul started the church. He was their spiritual father. There had been this incredible close connection, and these super apostles had come in, and they'd broken that connection. And they'd drawn some of the Corinthians off, away from what Paul calls a, their first devotion to their husband of Jesus Christ, to kind of marry them to this worldly idea of the way that you should be, and Paul is going, people, I gave birth to you. Why has there been this break in this relationship here? I ought to have been recommended by you, he says. Paul shouldn't have, have to defend himself against these con men preachers that had come into town. Now, they tried to show how much better they were than the Apostle Paul. And he, he should have counted on the church to defend them, defend him, but they didn't. And so that's what bo uh, drove Paul to boast about his uh, credentials, boasting about really his weaknesses. 
even in his great vision of heaven that he had, or his trip to heaven, we don't really know whether he actually died and went to heaven or had a vision, but even out of that, it was still about weakness, about how the Lord made him weak. And then I'm so glad because he shared that incredible verse where the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. That's unmerited favor for my power or for power, he said, is perfected or matured or made complete, not in human strength and ability, but in weakness. To rely upon Jesus Christ for everything. Now, the super apostles were busy boasting about their external strength and impressiveness, where inside, in their character, by the way, in the part that goes on into eternity, you know, our, our bodies will go away. The environment around us will dissolve. But the thing that will go into eternity is your character, the part of you that makes you you. Ought we not to be about making that character fit for the new environment of God's kingdom? But they weren't about that. Inside kind of reminds me what Jesus said about the religious leaders of his days, your, your whitewashed sepulchers. On the outside, you look so good and pure and white, but inside are dead men's bones. It's nothing but death. It's nothing but the opposite of what character in Jesus Christ ought to be like. So Paul boasted about his external weakness, but his internal power by the Holy Spirit, bringing this new life in Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm in no way inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. I like that because Paul may have considered himself nothing. At one point he said he's the least of all the apostles. But nothing in Jesus Christ is so much more than everything in this age. That's a key point at which people make a grave mistake. They make an error. They think, well, money brings security, therefore I ought to go after money. Um, Intimacy outside of the parameters that God has set, us, set for us brings um, pleasure, and so I need to go after that. And we have all these things, you know, I, I need security, so I'm going to go after the most powerful position I can get, so I'll feel secure. And um, God has a completely different economy and a completely different way of, of thinking. And Paul said, Without, or Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things. Because again, it's relying upon Him and not relying on ourselves. So then he goes on in verse 12. The signs of an apostle were performed among you in all endurance. Not only signs, but also wonders and miracles. I think that Paul puts this in partly to say, there really was a basis upon which you should have put your trust in me, that you should have defended me. I am an apostle, he says, and it was verified to you. Now, how does that happen? A person couldn't just call themselves an apostle. They still can't even today. Uh, there, there's a gift of apostleship. It's kind of a little bit of a different thing, but Paul's an apostle, kind of a capital A apostle. You had to have seen the Lord personally. You had to have been commissioned by him specifically. And you had to have performed miracles that would attest to that commission. You can check out Acts 2.22 for a little bit more on that. Now, Paul was clearly an apostle by that definition. And he says he performed the signs of an apostle with great endurance. And that word can also be translated patience. And I like that. Paul didn't ride into Corinth. I kind of picture one of those... Um, snake oil salesman from the Old West, you know, with the big wagons and all the stuff hanging off and the big sign. I have uh, had the opportunity to write about Oregon's history and have, was fascinated to read the history of physicians in the state of Oregon. And back in the pioneer days, the 1850s, 60s, 70s, even 1880s, things were not as they are today. We think of, you know, doctors in white coats and with the stethoscopes and hospitals and all this power and, and, and intelligence and science and all this. But in reality, even on the streets of Portland, it was mostly a bunch of snake oil salesmen. And they would come in loudly proclaiming miracle cures and they would hold up their bottle and you see them in the old museums and stuff. 
you know, Dr. Ginjar's miracle cure. It'll cure gout and cancer and, and pleurisy and whatever else ails you. You know, drink it and it'll cure you. Yeah, because it'll probably kill you. So yeah, you won't have that illness anymore. But in, in, in some ways, that's kind of what I think of when I think of these super apostles. Paul could have ridden in like a snake oil salesman, but have had real power. But he didn't. When Paul came in, these miracles that would have been performed would have been things that were done by the power of God to change lives when it was needed. Not to impress, but simply to confirm what God was doing on an as-needed basis. This was how Jesus operated. Jesus didn't go around saying, hey, you thought that was good? Watch me raise somebody from the dead. Ka-ching, you know, and boom, the person, you know. Whoa, that's impressive. I like the story where Jesus, I think, went back, went back to his hometown and, and he proclaimed really basically that he was the Messiah. And they got so mad that they took him up on the brow of a hill and they were going to throw him off. Well, now, if Jesus had really wanted to impress, he could have let him throw, throw him off, right? And he would have just kind of floated down or maybe just stayed in midair and then said, you guys have rejected me. Watch out. Kaboom, you know, and just taken him out would have been really impressive. In fact, Lucifer wanted him to do something very similar to that. Took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of the temple, and the fall down into the Kidron Valley was definitely lethal. And he said, throw yourself off, for the scriptures say he will cause his angels to have charge of you, and you won't be hurt. Would have been very impressive, but that's all it would have been. It also would have been outside of God's timing. And so, like Jesus, when Paul performed miracles, and we have them recorded for us, some of them anyway, in the book of Acts, it was when it was needed, not when it was impressive. And we should never seek to impress other people by our wisdom, even of the scriptures, by our knowledge, by our power, our, our position, or our abilities in the Holy Spirit. And this is where I actually part company a little bit from our more Pentecostal brethren because it's my position, I think Scripture teaches very clearly that we are a tool in the Holy Spirit's hands. The Holy Spirit is not a tool in ours. And there is this tendency in the church, I think, in some instances, where instead of the Spirit working invisibly most of the time, you know, there are supernatural gifts of the Spirit. I believe they are for the believer today. But what purpose is it? I believe the purpose is to touch the life of somebody in order to bring them into the family of God. Yet there are some in the church today that use the Holy Spirit as a way to show off or as a way to have some ecstatic experience that that alone in and of itself is the goal of being in the Spirit. And I think they're really missing the mark there. The goal is to heal. The goal is to show that Jesus is the Messiah, not to take you on some magical mystery tour of being in the Spirit. So verse 13, So in what way were you treated worse than the other churches? except that I personally did not burden you. Forgive me this wrong. So Paul says, I acted the same way in all the churches. I did one thing for you guys that I didn't do for anybody else, and that is I didn't have you support me at all. He came to Corinth, and he went about making tents to support himself. He collected money from other churches because he knew that money was a problem in Corinth. They were attached to money. They idolized money. And, and it, we found it here a lot through 2 Corinthians. And, and, and um, he, he sa goes on in verse um, 14 to say, Look, I'm ready to come to you this third time. I will not burden you, for I am not seeking what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Now, granted, I have not burdened you, 
Yet sly as I am, I took you in by deceit. Did I take advantage of you by anyone I sent you? I urged Titus to come and I sent the brother's brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Didn't we walk in the same spirit and in the same footsteps? So, Paul founded this church on his first visit. And he came again for what he called a painful visit to correct people who were persisting in sin. And he planned a third visit, but he postponed it because he discovered that there were continuing problems in the church and especially about their loyalty to, to Paul, their spiritual father. And now he's coming again. But he says again, I'm not going to burden you. I'm not going to take any money with you, uh, from you. He doesn't want their money. He says, I don't want what's yours. I want you. And that's actually a lot of what 2 Corinthians is all about. They'd abandoned their spiritual father, and he's saying, guys, what gives here? I don't want your stuff. I want you. I want your friendship. I want your love. I want your loyalty. Now, <clears throat> when he says here, it's uh, children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children, that was a common practice in the first century where parents would save up an inheritance for their children. And Paul, by not taking their money and working with his hands to earn his way while he was with them, was, was basically spending himself, his time, his labor, his money, because he wanted to help the Corinthians. And at the same time, he wanted to avoid any controversy about taking money because that's exactly what the false apostles had done. So his plea, after I've spent all my my all in loving you, will you still withhold your love from me? And, and moving to, to back to verse 16, he says, you know, I've, granted I've not burdened you, yet sly as I am, I took you in by deceit. The, the verse is a little bit hard to translate. The New Living Translation renders it this way. Some of you admit I was not a burden to you, but others still think I was sneaky and took advantage of you by trickery. Now, what is that about? I think most likely he's referring to the collection that they were taking to give to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Now, the Corinthians had started the whole deal. They said, we want to collect money to give to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Paul said, that's great. Collect all the money, and then when I come, we'll transform, transport it to Jerusalem. The collection went by the wayside, and that's part of what Paul addresses earlier in 2 Corinthians. But also what he addresses is that some apparently thought this was a backhanded way of Paul to rip off the Corinthians. They'd been so influenced by this age thinking, which says you go for the money even if you have to steal it. You look good on the outside, but you act according to your interests on the inside. And so, I don't take any money from you, Corinthians. Aren't I a good soul? But yet, he takes this collection for the saints, and then somehow it ends up filtering into his own pocket. Now, I, Paul's pretty upset that they would think that. You know what the real sad thing is? That's exactly what happens today. Not everywhere, but we've seen it in the news. So many ministries where there's this great collection that's taken, and lo and behold, most of the money went for lavish lifestyles of the leaders. And as uh, Desi Arnaz Jr. used to say, you've got some splaining to do. They're going to have lots of splaining to do before God. But Paul here is saying that... Um, Verse 17, did I take advantage of you by anyone I sent you? And the answer was no. It's a rhetorical question. They loved Titus. They respected Titus. They realized that Titus was the real deal, and he wasn't ripping him off. And so he says, didn't we walk in the same spirit and in the same footsteps? In other words, Titus and me are one and the same. We think the same. We acted the same. We are the same. If you don't think Titus was ripping you off, then why in the world are you thinking that I'm going to rip you off? So verse 19 You've thought all along that we were defending ourselves to you. No. In the sight of God, we are speaking in Christ, and everything, dear friends, is for building you up. Just to make it clear, 
Paul says, this is not a debate here. I'm not on the defense table helping you to make up your mind whether the false apostles are the real deal or I am. This is not a debate. Paul is simply making it clear that you guys need to make up your minds because this discussion we're having, this is happening before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will be the ultimate judge of who is right in this particular situation. Now, the purpose here wasn't to put the Corinthians down and lift Paul up. The purpose was to restore the relationship of the Corinthians to Paul and to Jesus Christ so they would continue making process in their maturation. Everything he's doing is to the eventual goal of building them up. The problem that happens when in the church we get into the, the, the worship of men and other sort of this age type of behaviors and thinking, we take our focus off the main thing. And the main thing is becoming more like Jesus in all that we think, say, and do so that we can be used better as a servant to spread the gospel even through our difficulties that we endure. In verse 20, he says, For I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want, and I may not be found by you to be what you want. There may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Now, some things had improved in Corinth, but Paul was worried that a lot of the problems that they experienced were still there. And perhaps the Corinthians, they wanted a super impressive leader. And as we saw earlier, Paul was anything but. In fact, they said his speech was despicable. That he was not the kind of person that you would naturally put your trust in. But what they got instead of what they really wanted was a father in the Apostle Paul, a father that's so concerned about his spiritual children that he's not going to let the sin go undealt with. And Paul worried that some of the sins that he had dealt with earlier were still there, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. And what strikes me as it's kind of funny is that, you know, oftentimes in the church, what we focus on is sin and bad stuff are, are like preferences. They're like cultural differences, style differences, like should Christians dance or what version of the Bible you teach out of. And what happens is all the while we're focused on these little minor things all this other stuff, this garbage, like what Paul describes, goes on in our lives and we don't even realize it. The Corinthians, they'd split into factions, remember that? They were jealous of each other's success because again, worldly measures of success, that's what makes you a better person in their mind. It led to angry confrontations between them and, and everything they could do was to get themselves ahead even if that meant slandering somebody, which is saying something openly that's false about somebody else, or gossiping, which is saying something bad about somebody else in secret. The whole idea was to put other people down so they could lift themselves up, and it led to this real arrogance. Arrogance, which is the opposite of servanthood, which is what Jesus is all about. And so their services, they were filled with disorder as everybody tried to show off how incredibly imp impressive in the spirit they were. And I would just suggest to us, and I totally include myself in this as well, it's really vital for us to realistically examine our motives. As Paul said, the whole idea is that we should do everything for the building up of one another, not the pushing down of one another so that we feel that we are just a little bit more important. Verse 21, I fear that when I come, my God will again humiliate me in your presence 
And I will grieve for many who sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, sexual immorality, and promiscuity that they practiced. If things weren't set right, Paul says he would be embarrassed and humiliated. Why? Remember, he's bringing the Macedonians with him. The Macedonians who didn't have all these problems that the people in Corinth were having with letting this age and its value system infiltrate their lives and take control. And I picture a, a class field trip. One class going to visit another, of school children, right? And what would happen is if this really well-mannered group of students, they got on the bus and they went over to their neighboring elementary school and they all filed off the bus really in order and, and of course no children actually exist like this, but just, just, just go with it here. And they walk quietly and expectantly into their neighboring elementary school's classroom to have an enjoyable time of joint art projects with their sister school. And they open up the door to the classroom and the kids are like throwing crayons at each other and they're hanging out the windows and they're piling desks on top of each other. They're yelling and screaming. It's all just a bunch of chaos. And the teacher's right in the middle of it doing everything with the kids. That's kind of, in a way, I sense a, a little bit of a hyperbolic uh, you know, example. But Paul is, is thinking, I'm going to bring these Macedonians here, these mature Christians who have the character of Jesus Christ built into their lives. And we're going to walk in the door of the Corinthian church. And you guys are a, a bunch of... of out of control school kids. I'm going to be humiliated. And part of the reason, he says, is because some of the stuff that he had addressed way back in 1 Corinthians still hadn't been dealt with. Now, the Greek words that are used in verse 21 suggest that the Corinthians were either still participating in or at least condoning some of the perverse sexual practices that existed in the idol worship of the culture around them. Remember how he told them to deal with a, a particular man who was openly practicing incest and they were proud of the fact that they weren't coming down on this guy. Now, I believe that exists as, uh, in the church today. It's very, very sad. Uh, I talked about relative truth. Uh, there is such a thing as absolute truth, absolutely. And you find that absolute truth recorded in the pages of the scriptures. And we want, we want to, you know, why can't we all just get along? We don't want to make waves. We don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. And so that leads us eventually to condone practices that are clearly not in the character of Jesus Christ. And there's a, there's a merry path you get led down when you start with that. And it ends up with embracing, advocating, and then requiring that same kind of behavior. And God is going to judge this world for doing that. And um, Paul is saying, I don't want to come in these doors and find that you guys haven't dealt with it, especially you leaders, because there's a time when the leaders of a church need to stand up and say, we can't condone this. I don't encourage church leaders to then become legalistic and look for every little thing that's broken in every little person. We're all broken, right? We're all broken in a whole bunch of ways. We're all a work in progress. We're going, as the Bible says, from glory to glory. And God will put His hand on different points in your life at different times. That's up to God. That's not up to us. So we shouldn't be going around trying to make each other perfect. All that's going to do is frustrate you and it's going to alienate you from your brother. However, if there, and to me, it all revolves around the heart attitude. What's your heart attitude about it? Are you saying, yes, I am broken in many ways? And I realize when I look at the, the pages of the scriptures, I look in the mirror and I see myself reflected back and I realize how weak I really am, how, how rotten inside I really am. Oh, Lord. Who will rescue me from this body, as Paul said? But it's the Lord who will do that. He's transforming us from glory to glory, little bit by little bit. 
And if our heart attitude is, God, I, uh, I believe, help my unbelief, make me better, then I'm cool with that. You're struggling, and you realize that you can't do it on your own, and what does that lead to? Reliance upon Jesus Christ, even in your weakness. Is that not what Paul was saying? But if our heart attitude, on the other hand, is, I've got it all together, I've read the Bible, it has some good things to say, but I've decided to ignore certain parts that make me feel uncomfortable because feeling uncomfortable can't be a good thing. And then we go about openly, even proudly, doing things that are clearly in violation of what the Lord says. Now, we're either deluded or we're in open rebellion against God. And if that begins to infiltrate the church, other people begin Became, become influenced by that kind of behavior, and then people start getting picked off by the enemy. And as a, as a church leader, we can't let that happen. So we have to deal with it. And the people in Corinth, the leaders, they weren't dealing with it at all. And so Paul says, I am really afraid that when I come back, I'm going to be humiliated because you guys haven't had the guts to stand up and say, we need to do something about this. We need to help the hard attitude to change. The goal is always restoration. As Paul will say in Galatians, which is the next book that we're going to come to here shortly, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. That's how it ought to take place. God's going to hold the leaders of the churches accountable for allowing sin to be unattended to in that way. So what do we get from this second half of chapter 12? Just three brief things that I wanted to pull back out again to our attention. The first is, you can trust the apostles' message. We have many voices speaking at us today, many voices that claim to be spiritual. There's books out there wildly popular. I think there's one who, that's really been at the top of the bestseller lists this spring and summer called Love Wins. It's garbage. It's garbage. They ought to just take all those books and recycle them and print Bibles with the paper pulp, you know. Uh, the guy basically says there's no, there's no such thing as hell, and in the end everybody gets to go to heaven, and so, you know, don't worry. Be happy. And... Um, it, it's not true. It, 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 the, it goes against the absolute truth that Jesus Christ said in, in His Word. He is the Word of God. Remember John chapter 1? The Word became flesh. The Word became voice as Jesus spoke. And then the Word became written down as Jesus' apostles received from Him the spoken Word of God and they wrote it down in books, or they transcribed it or, or dictated it to others. And then the Holy Spirit, again, God, spoke to the apostles, and then they wrote letters. The apostolic message is one that you can trust, and you have to trust it first. What I find happening a lot these days, it's very, very troubling. I was talking to somebody the other day. Somebody had joined their Bible study, and, and they said, Yes, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, and, and they, they mentioned some version of the Bible that the person didn't really recognize. And so they kind of went out and, and looked at it and started asking the person some other questions. They said, yes, we, we do use this version of the Bible in our church. I think they call it the inspired version. And occasionally when we need to reference it, we also use the Book of Mormon. <gasps> the person nearly had a heart attack. We see this happening a lot, where again, it's the potluck religion. The Bible's good for the things that make us feel comfortable, but when we want some alternative viewpoints, we bring in other things, like the Book of Mormon. You know, talk about garbage. You know, it's like one of those things that's been in your refrigerator for six months that you forgot about. And you open up the container and, and you practically pass out because of the stink. That's about what the Book of Mormon's worth. And I invite any Mormons listening to email me in. We'll have a, have a discussion. Uh, it, it mirrors the enemy's point of view almost entirely because it tells you that you can be God. And that's exactly what Lucifer wanted to do, and that was that the heart of the rebellion that caused our fall. But anyway, the apostolic message as recorded in Scripture can be trusted. 
So don't let slick sounding new kinds of doctrines sway you away. He passed, Jesus passed his word on to his, his disciples, his apostles, and Paul was one of them. And so you can trust it. The second thing is out of verse 19, where Paul says, everything, dear friends, is for building you up. And I would ask us to look at what is our motivation for dealing with other people. The, the sad thing is that sometimes we think that judging somebody else is building them up. But in reality, it's just tearing them down a little bit so we feel a little bit more smug because, oh, well, we're not like that. We've really got to watch our motivation. Sometimes the thing that builds somebody up is to, let, is to make yourself less. To say, you know, I experienced that same weakness. We don't want to appear weak before people. But even as Paul was saying here in the first part of the chapter, it's our weaknesses where we can let the strength of Jesus Christ shine through the clearest. And then finally, this one's, oh, this, is probably, this is the hardest one, I think, for me. And that's to ask you, you know, Paul says, how am I going to find you when I come? How will the Lord find you when he comes back? When he steps into the classroom of your life? If Jesus came into our church today, if he came into our home, if he came into our private study, what would he find? That alone should make us sit up and take notice to deal with the garbage as the Lord identifies it while continuing to ask him to peer into our lives even as the psalm says, you know, try me, O Lord, search me, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. Um, and I'm going to there's a, there's a thing that's kind of birthing in my heart that I want to share along those lines. But there is, there is stuff that's broken inside us that the Lord wants to fix. But we need to ask Him and invite Him to do that. And as difficult as it is, we come out the other end so much more healthy and whole and full. It's that transformation process. How would the Lord find things in your life when He comes? Just think about that this week. Let's pray. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, you might be here with us this morning. You might be watching or listening at another time and place. And you realize that if Jesus Christ walked into your life, he would find nothing that would please him. He would walk in as a stranger. And I would invite you today to reach out to him that he would no longer be a stranger, but that he would be a savior. Because all those things that we um, make mistakes on, all those weaknesses, all those things that we do that we're not proud of, Jesus already received upon himself the penalty for all those things that you have done, past, present, and future. But you have to come to him. You have to reach out to him. You have to appropriate that sacrifice. And you just simply doing, do that by confessing him as the Savior for you. And then making him the king instead of you in your life. You don't have to clean yourself up, make yourself presentable. Jesus does that. You just have to come. So I invite you to come today, to bow your heart and your life, to give him all the junk that's inside you. Say, Lord, please forgive me through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, because I have done wrong. I've missed the mark of your character, but I want to be like you. I recognize there's something special about you, Jesus, and I want it. I want to serve you and I want to belong to you, not just now, but every day from now on through eternity. If you can pray a prayer like that out of the sincerity of your heart, then you've begun a journey of transformation that will culminate on the day when Jesus returns, when he comes to find you, what he will find in your life is his life. Because he gave his life in exchange for yours. You lay down yours, you pick up his all of his righteousness, all of his goodness, 
it becomes yours for free, not at no cost, but free to you. Do that today. And then begin to read. Start in the Gospel of John. Start to read about who this Jesus really is and get to know him. And then join a church, join a fellowship. Don't let the enemy discourage you and take you away from this newfound faith that you've had, but believe and then fellowship with other believers so they can encourage you. For those of us who know you, Lord, I pray that you would search our hearts. And that if you see any way in us that's hurtful, that's, that's dead, that needs to be cleansed, then do that cleansing work in us, Lord, so that we can be more like you and be used of you as a servant in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.